I want all of these games, but I only have enough money for one. Being a gamer is hard work. It doesn't matter if you're a modern or retro gamer, you just haven't got the money to play or buy them all. It's a fact of life, one that we are all far too familiar with. How do you get around it? Well, apart from piracy and debt, Slope's Game Room has one other option. What if I told you there was a way of buying several games for the price of one, and sometimes even cheaper than that? Introducing Game Compilations. These things have really made a comeback in recent years with Sony at the forefront of the compilation market, but you'd be wrong to believe that this is a new thing far, far from it. My earliest memory of game compilations actually come from the Amstrad days, when so many of my beloved games came from these compilations. And what's great about these is that even if most of the games are absolute rubbish, you're normally going to find at least a couple of diamonds in the rough. After my Amstrad days, if you've been watching my channel for a while, you'll know that I eventually got the Mega Drive, and when I did make the move to the world of Sega, the game compilations didn't stop there, because if you was lucky enough to live in Europe in 1993, then you were treated to the amazing Mega Games. Wow! What a great way of building up your collection. I managed to get the first Mega Games in this series for £20. That's cheaper than one game. And just look at this. I've got Super Hang On, great game. Columns, <laughs> move over Tetris. FIFA Italia 90, uh, anyway, look at these two games. Apart from this one, these two games for 20 squid, that ain't half bad. Let's see what you've got, Super Nintendo. Ah. Anyway, I was happy as Larry to get this collection, and after looking a little closer, I realised that this wasn't just called Mega Games. Oh no no no. It was Mega Games 1. That must mean there is a sequel. So after several weeks of £5 pocket money savings, I smashed open my piggy bank and made my way to Electronic Boutique to see what other Mega Games were available. Oh my god, there's not just one more Mega Games, there are two more Mega Games! But what to do? I'm now back to the drawing board. I want both two and three, but I've only got enough money for one. Right, some serious gaming decisions need to be made here. After all, this is my entertainment for the next month or so. This is what I'm going to be bragging about on the playground. I have to get this right. So, number two is the first obvious choice, but I already own Streets of Rage and Revenge of Shinobi, and I've got no idea what this is. Let's have a look at number three. Hmm, this doesn't look that interesting, but these do. That's it, I've made my decision. Mega Games free it is, because let's face it, aliens are far cooler than the hobbits. So I spent my well earned pocket money on number three, took it back and started playing Alien Storm. Looking back, I think I made the right choice. Alien Storm is a great game, and one that I am sure to cover in a future episode. Super Thunderblade was okay, and Super Monaco GP well, I'll tell you what I think of that when I eventually get round to playing more than 5 minutes. Now, my younger gamer self was faced with another challenge to tackle. You see, now there is a gap in my collection. A gap in my collection. This had to be fixed. Luckily for me, my parents were doing a boot fair that weekend and I quickly worked out that if I sell both my Revenge of Shinobi and Streets of Rage for £10 each, and with only one more week of pocket money, I would have enough money to buy Mega Games 2 and my collection would be complete. So I priced up the games, went to the boot fair, sold the games, saved the money, went back to EP, bought the game and now my collection is finally complete. I have all of the Mega Games. And now I've got Mega Games 2, I suppose I might as well try out Golden Axe. And that was how I discovered Golden Axe. So it's time to sit back and relax while I take you through the complete history of the Golden Axe franchise. In the late 80s and early 90s, Sega absolutely killed it in the arcades with hit after hit after hit. And in 1989, after such great releases such as Fantasy Zone, Alien Syndrome and Afterburner to name a few, Sega dropped another bombshell into the arcades. Golden Axe. So how did this game come about? 
Well, in 1987, Sega hired Makuto Oshida, who became a part of the company's premier internal development team, called AM1 R&D Division, and created several games such as the previously mentioned Alien Storm and Altered Beast. After the huge success that was Altered Beast, Makoto wanted to create a game that ended up being quite different to what we know today. Inspired by Arnold Schwarzenegger's classic movie Conan the Barbarian, he originally wanted Golden Axe to be an RPG. Sega, however, wasn't having any of it. Why? Well, while Nintendo owned the home console market, Sega owned the arcades, and an RPG for its struggling master system didn't seem the right choice at the time. Now a hack and slash beat em up which will devour kids pocket money and can easily be ported to the home system definitely does. So armed with his orders from Sega, Makoto went away and just one year after the success of Altered Beast in 1989, Golden Axe was released to the arcades. The symbols you see behind the game logo not only feature several weapons found in the game, a sword, a hammer and an axe, but actually loosely translate to Battle Axe. Now Battle Axe was what the series was going to be originally called, before eventually changing its name to Broad Axe, and right before its release, head of Sega of America forced the name change once again to Golden Axe. This was due to the Dwarf's Axe being a slight hint of gold. The head of Sega was so persistent on this name change that he refused to release the game in the US unless the game's name was changed, which obviously it was. The game is set in the land of Urea and is based around the mythical weapon called the Golden Axe, which grants its user great power. Death Adder, this game's bad guy, has captured the king and princess, holding them hostage in their own castle, and his plan is to kill them and destroy the legendary Golden Axe. In the game, you are given the choice of three iconic characters and three separate storylines. The first is the dwarf Gilius Thunderhead, who is my personal favourite. The story goes that Gilius's brother was killed by the soldiers of Death Adder. Secondly is Axe Battler, which obviously takes his inspiration from Conan the Barbarian. This Barbarian, who does not wield an axe as the name would have you believe but instead a sword, is looking for revenge for the murder of his mother. And finally, just like all beat em ups, we have the female token Tyrus Flair, an Amazon woman whose parents were both killed by Death Adder. One of the original ideas was to actually make the game for three players, but because the engine could only show six characters at once, they decided against it. If you do however want to play a good three player beat em up, I personally suggest either Moonwalker or Cadillacs and Dinosaurs. As you play the game, if you look into it a tad closer, you realise that each level is actually linked. You find yourself in a place called Turtle Village, which is actually on the back of a giant turtle that swims you across the sea to land where you eventually end up on the back of a giant eagle, which will fly you to the castle where you fight and defeat Death Adder. Now one of the cool things you can do in Golden Axe is ride the back of several different creatures, or Bizarians as they're known in the game. One of these is the mythical creature Cockatrice, or Chicken Leg, depending on who you speak to, who actually made his first appearance in Makoto's first game, Altered Beast. As I stated before, this game is really, really good and actually a lot harder than I remembered it. Sure it doesn't get as much playtime from me as other beat em ups, but one thing is for sure, I will still be playing this in the old people's home chasing those annoying little robbers around building up my potions so I can do those crazy special powers. And oh my god at those special powers. Instead of having just one, each player actually has several, which really entices you to play several times so you can actually try them all out. If you lived in Japan when this game was released, you was actually treated to a tiny little intro not found in the US or Europe releases of the arcade, which obviously was far too gory for us. Another interesting fact, and a first for its time, was that when you killed a bad guy, the remains would actually stay on the screen and not fade away or flash away like other hack and slash games. It's games like Golden Axe that really do show us why Sega were a force to be reckoned with back in the company's heyday. Do yourself a favour and go and play this game. Spoiler alert, once completed, the game actually has a fantastic ending that shows all of the Golden Axe characters jumping out of the arcade machine into the real world. Unfortunately, or fortunately depending on how you look at it, they never went with this idea for the sequel. One thing you may not have noticed in the game 
is that not only do the playable characters all have weapons, but every single character in the game has a weapon. The reason for this was when Makoto was tasked with making his hack and slash game, they looked to Double Dragon for inspiration. But because they didn't want to make a direct copy of the game, they gave everyone a weapon to try and spice things up a bit. It should be no surprise to anyone that this game was a critical and commercial success. Sega quickly realised the potential of this great game and decided to port it to the newly released system, the Mega Drive. Dave Whitney wanted the real arcade games at home, so he got them. Mike Rogers wanted them too, but he got a Genesis system by Sega. Why? Check it out. Arcade screen left, Genesis screen right. If they look the same, you've answered correctly. Besides, Genesis has real-life action in sports games, flying games, and adventure games. The hottest library going. So if you want real arcade action, there's only two ways to get it. Dave, we got your golden axe. Or get Genesis by Sega. We bring the arcade experience home. As I already stated before, I discovered this game a long time before I knew of the arcade version and unfortunately the game doesn't hold up as well as I remember when compared to things like Streets of Rage and Alien Storm. And while we're on the subject of Alien Storm, you can actually see a small cameo of the Golden Axe game in the arcade version of that game. Anyway, the reason I say that this game doesn't hold up is that the hit detection, stupidity of the AI and the lack of different enemies just seems a little bit dated in my eyes. But let's be honest, this game is over 25 years old, so it's obviously going to be a bit rough around the edges. In regards to the negatives about the game, that's pretty much all I have to say, because this game is an absolute blast to play. Never played it? Do yourself a favour and give it a go. Just like the arcade version, you are instantly hooked in. You instantly know what to do, and if you have a friend over, then this is one of the better old school co-op experiences you could possibly have. And in my opinion, the Mega Drive version of Golden Axe is the best the series has to offer for home users. Fun little fact, you'll notice that on one of the earlier levels, there is a building with the words Deb written on it. What or who is Deb, might you ask? Well, Deb is actually bed, read backwards, which is the Japanese traditional way from reading right to left. At the end of the game, when the credits roll, you get to see the stats of each character, including the height and weight. If you're going to take anything away from this video, it's to never ask a lady how much she weighs. These stats go on for other characters too, as seen here in the little thief section. The developers messed around even more with the credits, going as far as to not even include their own names. The lead software designer, for instance, changed his name to his favourite motorbike. Why they did this is beyond me. Personally, I would love to have my name attached to such a legendary piece of work. Now, the Mega Drive port of the classic arcade game really was one of the first times for me that you could get an arcade feeling game in the living room, which was Sega's mission statement all along. And it was because of this that Sega finally started to gain traction over the big N. And with the Sega name growing, they decided to port the classic Mega Drive game to another competing system. No, not the Nintendo, but instead the PC Engine in Japan. And if you didn't know, the PC Engine in Japan was trumping the Mega Drive. This port was being done by Telnet, and in short, was an absolute shambles. What could have been the ultimate version of Golden Axe quickly became the worst. Master System players were not left out either, as they were treated to a lighter version of the game, which although obviously not as good as its two older brothers, is 100% better than its deformed cousin, and still worth picking up. Although something to bear in mind, is you can only play as Axe Battler in this version of the game. What was more interesting though was the fact that the Master System actually got an exclusive Golden Axe game in 1991, titled Golden Axe Warrior. Think of this game as a spin-off rather than a sequel. Here we drop the Turtles arcade style gameplay from the original and move far closer to a Zelda clone. Unfortunately, this little RPG gem was released very late in the system's life, well after the release of the Mega Drive original, and because of this, it's often forgotten. 
you need to find the nine magic crystals that Death Adder has hidden through the kingdom of Firewood. Awful names aside, this game is actually really good, and that's coming from someone that never plays RPG adventure games. Check this one out if you fancy something a little bit different. Unfortunately though, the game has never been ported and goes for a pretty penny these days. However, if you fancy something a little bit cheaper, then Axe Battler, a Legend of the Golden Axe could be for you. The game was exclusively released for Sega's answer to the Game Boy, the Game Gear, and was released in 1992. Where the Master System game copied the style of the first Zelda game, Axe Battler copies its sequel Link's Adventure. This time Axe Battler is yet again tasked with defeating the evil Death Adder and restoring peace to the land of Firewood. Currently the game goes for about a fiver and although not as good as the Master System game, really is not that bad a game at all, especially considering the Game Gear's limited hardware. The very same year as the Game Gear spin-off, arcade goers retreated with another amazing sequel to the classic game and they got Golden Axe Revenge of Death Adder. This in my opinion is the first true sequel to the original. This time you can play up to four players at the same time and the four you choose from are Stern the Barbarian, Dora the Kenterite, Little Tricks, and finally Gilius Thunderhead from the first game riding on the back of Goa the Giant. This is my normal go-to guy. Just like many other side-scrolling games you was actually able to link the characters together to do several moves which makes playing the game multiplayer really worth your time. The magic ability really took a step up in this game too, and instead Little Tricks actually was able to sprout trees which had apples hanging from them so your teammates could replenish their health. This game took co-op to a new level. New characters, new graphics, the ability to switch characters when you die, this is without a doubt not only the hardest in the series to get hold of, but the very best the series and possibly the genre has to offer. If you ever happen to be out and see one of these arcade machines still in the wild, drop whatever you're doing and go and play it, preferably in multiplayer. So you would expect that with the success of this fantastic game that it would get a slightly dumbed down version for the Mega Drive. You would be wrong. Unfortunately we got the incredibly average Golden Axe 2. Okay maybe I'm being a tad harsh, Golden Axe 2 is good but not what you would expect from a sequel whose original gameplay helped position Sega in the limelight before a certain blue hedgehog made an appearance. Golden Axe 2, which was only ever released on the Mega Drive, actually came out before the arcade sequel and was never ported to other Sega systems and only recently showed up on later Sega compilations. If you like the original Golden Axe, then this game really is just more of the same, perhaps a bit too much of the same for me. Sure the graphics are slightly better and you have a few more enemies but overall the game is essentially Golden Axe 1.5. The game is also a tad easier than the original. At the end of the day it is still worth picking up but after playing some of the others it might have you feeling a little bit unsatisfied. What fans really wanted was a sequel worthy of the name and Sega Japan were making what looked like to be that game. Teased with constant screenshots and previews, what did us Mega Drive fans finally get? Nothing. And that's a good thing. In 1993, Golden Axe 3 was released, but only in Japan. Unless of course you had Sega's online Sega channel service, which was the only other way of playing it besides importing. It was a huge disappointment. Let's start with the cover. Why the hell didn't they use the far better unused Boris Vallejo artwork is beyond me. For me the best way to look at it is that Golden Axe 2 was too similar to the original and Golden Axe 3 is way too different. Now Gilius does make another welcome return, but this time you can't play as him and instead this time you choose from Kane Grinder, who is basically a clone of Axe Battler, Sarah Byrne, who's a dancer out for revenge, Brayud Krager, who is the slow strong guy, and Kronos Evil Late, a cursed panther man. The story goes that the Golden Axe has once again been taken, and this game's bad guy, Damned Hellstrike, also known as the Prince of Darkness, has placed an evil curse on all of the warriors of the land. It's up to you to go get it back and save the day. So why is it so bad? Well, it seems that the team decided to try and make this game more like other beat-em-ups rather than its original and in doing so lost all of its original Golden Axe charm. The graphics are far more bland, the characters and dare I say it the story is pretty damn awful 
the one saving grace from the game is that the soundtrack is actually pretty damn good. It's a shame that after so long in waiting that this was the final proper Golden Axe game that we was treated to on the Mega Drive. So what was next for the franchise? Well, Sega moved back to the winning streak that was the arcades and in 1994 released Golden Axe The Duel, but this time they moved away from the side-scrolling gameplay and gave us a one-on-one -on -one fighting game. Unfortunately, this game was incredibly average. It was released at a time when one-on-one -on -one fighting games were being churned out faster than kids could play them, and because of this, it was lost in the fog. The lineup of characters you choose from obviously expanded considerably from the good old side-scrolling days, and all original characters ended up being dropped. And who replaced them? Their friends and family. So, Kane Blade, the main guy, is a barbarian and a descendant of Stern from the Revenge of Death Adder. Millen Flair is a female warrior who's related to Tyrus Flair from the first Golden Axe. Gilius Rockhead comes from us from the same tribe as Gilius Thunderhead from the original. And then there's everyone else. Jam, a young girl who was released in the wilderness by a beastie spirit, and as a result, attacks with giant claws. Doc is a ninja with a katana sword. Kill is a wizard thief who apparently kills people that get too close to his hometown. Green is part plant and animal and the last of her race. Zoma is a wizard. Panchos is an inventor looking for the golden axe but no one really knows why. What's pretty cool is that you've got Mr. Bad Guy himself, Death Adder, who returns with his fire breathing shield from the Revenge of Death Adder game. And then you've got Golden Axe. Well, obviously not the Golden Axe. Instead, this is the game's final boss and a representation of the powerful axe. Graphically, the game looks pretty good, but gameplay-wise, it's just incredibly average. We've all played these sort of forgettable one-on-one -on -one fighting games in the past, and if you owned a Saturn back in the day, then you were treated to the port. Why they didn't release the Return to Death Adder game instead is beyond me. That game would have been worth so much right now, and I, for one, would 100% pay the price. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was the last time we saw anything of Golden Axe for 10 whole years. Now during those 10 years, it was a pretty hard time. Sega unfortunately had stopped making game consoles and moved to being 100% a software developer for the companies that they previously saw as competition. And the biggest of all that competition during this time was obviously the PlayStation 2. As a diehard Sega fan, this was a tough pill to swallow, and eventually the Big Blue released the Sega Ages version of Golden Axe for the system. What this is is essentially a remake of the original game, with up-to-date graphics and gameplay which sounds great on paper, but what we ended up getting was a game that made that PC Engine game look good. How bad is this? It's absolutely awful. A game that is to be avoided at all costs. Pick up the soundtrack, Put down the game and don't ever even bother trying it. Nothing more needs to be said about this game, it's worth 0% of your time. We are now at the final stage so far with this series, and in 2008 we got Golden Axe Beast Rider for the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360. If you want the game, it currently stands for a couple of quid second hand, but I really wouldn't waste your time. The game is not great. Now actually scrub that, the game's hardly okay. It screams poor production and is full of game ending bugs and horrific combat that fully makes playing it an absolute chore. Be careful what you wish for Sega fans, for years I wanted a sequel and this is what I got. Death Adder returns this time, voiced by James Avery of all people, you know Uncle Phil from the Fresh Prince of Bel Air, and this time is not after the Golden Axe but instead after the power of the Ancient Dragon Titan. Honestly the story is paper thin and the short time I played the game I ended up losing track or should I say interest in any of it. If you are however really that bothered I'm sure there's a let's play somewhere on YouTube for you. For me however there are far too many good games out there for me to spend any time with games like this. Even Sega knew that they did bad. In an interview with Computer and Video Games magazine one of the Sega bosses Mike Hayes states we need to deliver a good product and in some instances we have done that look back when we redid Sega Rally. It scored well and was moderately successful commercially. But then with other great franchises like Golden Axe, we didn't produce a great game at all. Going forward, if we're going to look at any existing IP to bring out the locker, we have to make sure we get the quality to a level we now expect. Maybe one day we will get the game we deserve. 
and Sega have not given up just yet, putting Gilius in the fantastic Sega Superstars Tennis and Sonic and All Star Racing Transform, and that game actually has a whole track entirely inspired to the Golden Axe franchise called Adder's Lair. One funny note is that during development, Gillis's new voice actor was asked to do a massive roar. Not 100% understanding, the voice actor went ahead and instead of making the sound, screamed the words ROAR. The development team ended up finding this so funny that this is what you actually hear in the final game. Axe Battler and Tyrus Flair also make cameos in the easy mode of Sega Ages 2500 version of Dynamite Decker, with Death Adder making an appearance as one of the game's bosses. If the story of Golden Axe grabs your attention, then you may be interested to hear that the series actually had a small comic run inside of Sonic the comic, just like Streets of Rage did. And if that is still not enough, there is even talk of Sega turning the Golden Axe franchise into a TV show and or animated movie. I don't believe that this will ever happen, but let's face it, crazier things have happened. And that, my friends, is the story of Golden Axe. This series has walked a long, strange path since its original arcade days, with about a 50-50 success rate. Now, whatever you think about Golden Axe, you can't deny its importance on the gaming world. A game series that is still regarded as one of the greats, and for good reason. If you've never played them before, then you owe it to yourself to go choose your warrior and go up against the evil Death Adder. And who knows, maybe one day we will finally see the sequel that we deserve. What you are seeing here is a promo of that game that we so desire, made by Sega Studios Australia. This was supposed to be part of a new series of games called Sega Reborn. Sega Studios Australia actually had plans to remake several games and what's bizarre is that the games all were somehow going to be linked. Just imagine it, Golden Axe in the same world as Streets of Rage and, and Outrun and Alien Storm, the possibilities are endless. It's a crazy idea that I would have loved to have seen, but this is as far as the games got as Sega Studios Australia have actually gone under due to a restructure from Sega and the last game they produced was the surprisingly good Castle of Illusion starring Mickey Mouse. And that my friends is the complete history of the Golden Axe franchise. Actually hold up, before we go ahead I want to talk just a little bit more about those mega game games. So. I was right as a lad in 1993, they did only make three Mega Games games, but only two years later they released three more Mega Games, but this time we got Mega Games 6 Volume 1, Mega Games 6 Volume 2 and finally Mega Games 6 Volume 3. What makes these different? Well now you get six games on each cartridge, that's right six games, that's a total of 27 Mega Drive games on just six cartridges. Sounds cool right? Wrong. You see, Mega Games 6 Volume 1, 2 and 3 are all just compilations of the first three Mega Games. Sure, this isn't too bad if you don't own the original trilogy like I did, but they didn't only copy that trilogy, they also copied themselves, and might I add, in a very misleading way. Let me explain. If you look at Mega Games 6 Volume 3 compared to the other two, you'll notice that yeah, sure you get one new game here, but Super Thunder Blade is now Super Thunder Blade. The Revenge of Shinobi is now just Revenge of Shinobi. Super Monaco is now Super Monaco GP. And what's worse of all is World Cup Italia 90 is the exact same game minus the title screen and is now called Sega Soccer. Who did Sega think they were fooling? So with that in mind, if you're like me and you have all six Mega Game games now, you would in fact have Super Thunder Blade twice Golden Axe twice, Alien Storm twice, Super Hang On three times, Super Monaco GP three times, Revenge of Shinobi three times, Streets of Rage three times, World Cup Italia 90 four times, and Columns four times. And finally, the most mass produced game on the Mega Drive Sonic the Hedgehog 1 once. That's 10 games instead of the 27 you would expect. Sure, the later three collections were all bundled separately with Mega Drives, but the fact that they say Volume 1, 2 and 3 really makes someone like me want to get them all. For me, as a die-hard Sega fan, it's a massive shame that they messed this up so badly. 